Hello everyone, this is presentation for the wireless communication subject at the University of Florida and I am presenting this video for the final project of mine in the course. The topic is performance analysis of OSDM wireless communication system under various conditions. Going to the introduction, OSDM stands for Orthogonal Frequency Division Multiplexing. It is a frequency division multiplexing scheme used as a digital multicarrier modulation method. Unlike other digital multicarrier modulation methods like the FMT, it has advantages because it uses a much lesser bandwidth to transmit at a higher data rate. Because a an, an modulation technique like FMT uses multiple frequencies spaced and not overlapped with each other. But in OFTM, the different frequencies of the subcarriers are overlapped, but the integrity is maintained by the orthogonality of it. What does orthogonality mean? It means each subcarrier is separated by a 90 degree phase. Here, a data is first taken in as serial data and divided into parallel data streams, and each data stream or a subcarrier is modulated with conventional modulation scheme like a QAM or a PSK at a low symbol rate. This each subcarrier is exploits the fact that it has much more data encoded in it than it can be done in a single carrier modulation scheme in the same bandwidth. OFTM has developed into a popular scheme used in applications such as digital video, audio broadcasting, wireless networking mobile communication and whatnot. Moving into the investigation of my in the project, the first investigation, VR analysis of OGM without guard band. What does VR stand for? VR means bit error rate. What do we mean by bit error rate? Bit error rate means how many bits of data that we receive from a transmitted signal has been prone to error and doesn't match the actual transmitted bit pattern. And the rate of it is called the BER. In this present slide, I'm showing a graph that shows a 16 QAM BER for our OLTM system under two channel conditions. One for the first being AWGN channel, that is an additive wide Gaussian noise channel, which is very similar to an ideal channel that doesn't take into account the real world problems when transmitting data. And the second is the relay channel. It takes into account the more important things that is there in a real time channel. It takes into account the flat fading channel, the multipath losses. The multipath losses are the losses that our channel faces when it is to be transmitted over a large distance and it has to go through a various obstructions. And when it faces obstructions, it tries to navigate in a different path. So from a point of transmission to the point of receiving, the signal goes via multiple paths till while it reaches the receiver. And these problems are taken into account by the relay channel. As you can see in the graph, the red line that is the AWGN analytic shows that it performs much better than a relay fading channel because it doesn't take into account the real world problems. As you can see, the bit error rate versus the EV by N naught shows the relay channel performs a lot worse than our AWGN channel, but this is something that's very near to the real world. Moving on, the first thing I will say is the effect of the guard interval. What's a guard interval? The OFM symbol that is being transmitted is padded with extra bits so that it can handle the multipath delay spread. What is a multipath delay spread? As discussed earlier, the multipath has the multiple paths that the signal takes to reach the receiver causes a huge amount of delay and that delay has a time offset. To take care of that, we need a guard interval. Hence, we extend the OFTM signal that we are transmitting so that it can take care of the losses that has occurred for the multipath delay spread. The guard interval can be of various types. It can be a zero padding, that is padding the OFDM signal with zero bits either at the prefix or at the suffix or it can be a cyclic prefix as the name suggests. The last bits of the OFDM symbol to be transmitted is taken as a subpart and added to the 
front of the signal as a prefix and sent over the channel or it can be a cyclic suffix where the front part of the OFDM symbol is taken as a sub part and added to the back of the OFDM symbol to be transmitted calling the cyclic suffix. The very important thing that we need to take care while specifying the guard interval it should be is that it should be greater than the delay spread otherwise we will be facing something called the inter symbol interference problem. Now showing cyclic prefix as guard interval as we can see from the diagram on the top that the cyclic prefix is a part of the OFDM symbol cut and joined at the front of the OFDM symbol and that is being demarcated by the symbol TG and the total symbol time is the T sub and the, and the addition of TG. CP is added to extend the OFDM symbol by copying the last samples of the OFDM symbol into its front. CP is set longer than or equal to the maximum delay of the multipath channel because of the reason that I have explained earlier as it incurs ISI effect and if the proper timing is set for us the CP we can mitigate the ISI effect of an OFDM symbol and thus transmitting a beta data. As we can see from the graph with that's called the BER with 16 bit cyclic prefix we see the BER performance of the relay fading channel has improved a lot from what it was without the cyclic padding, prefix padding and hence this guard interval definitely does improve the performance of the OFDM transmission. Moving into the other impairments that an OFDM transmission has, the very important thing is that the offset at the receiver. It has two types of offset at the receiver, the first one being the carrier frequency offset. Carrier frequency offset or CFO as it's called as, a, as an acronym is caused by the Doppler frequency shift and it is being taken as the ratio of the frequency offset versus the subcarrier spacing of the two OFDM symbols that are being transmitted in a single data pattern. The graph here shows the effect of this CFO on the transmission. As the amount of CFO is increased, we can see that under an AWGN channel, the bit error rate of the OFDM transmission drastically deteriorates and we have a lot of bits in error that might be a point of time if the CFO is not taken care of that we get receive all bits in error and the entire data is corrupt. So the thing these things should be taken into account while doing the transmission. Moving on the CFO estimation we need to estimate how much offset are we getting in the receiver side so that we can compensate for that and get a proper transmission. The CFO can be estimated using various techniques. The things that I've investigated in the project is the first being the cyclic prefix method. As explained, the cyclic prefix is the same as what I have explained earlier. It causes a phase rotation by a factor of 2 pi n epsilon by n. CFO can be estimated as a product of the cyclic prefix and the corresponding real part of the OFDM symbol. How do we do that? Because the product of the CP and the OFDM symbol will only be real if the entire bit pattern has been received correctly at the receiver. But if it is not received, it gives a value that's in the imaginary part of the axis. And hence, the magnitude of the imaginary part gives us the idea or the estimate of how much offset do we have for the CFO in the symbol received. It can be also investigated by methods like training symbol where a training symbol is nothing but our data bits that are added into the OFDM symbol to be transmitted and transmitted over the channel and received. And once it is received, we try to find out if the trans training symbol is something that gives us the proper estimate of the CFO, but it has a lot higher mean square error than it should have for a frequency domain estimation. Frequency domain estimation works best. It goes for a pilot based estimation. The pilot based estimation means 
Uh, what a pilot means is that we add known bit patterns inside the transmitted data and that bit pattern is known at the receiver. So when the bit pattern is received at the receiver, we check if the known pilot is present in the transmitted data that we have received at the receiver. And if it is there, we know we have received a proper signal. Uh, else, the difference that we have gives us the idea about how much CA4 do we have at the receiver. Looking at the graph, we can see it supports the theoretical knowledge that a frequency domain estimation that performs best because the yellow line that's the pilot based estimation performs with the least mean square error compared to the SNR of the transmission. When the SNR increases, the MSE decreases. Whereas for a cyclic prefix based technique, it performs the worst. Moving on to the symbol time offset estimation. Symbol time offset causes phase distortion as well as ISI in OFTM. This is also affected by the presence of CFO. But keeping CFO aside, we can estimate STO by various methods like the training symbol. It's the same method that is being used for CFO estimation also. And the next being the cyclic prefix method. Here is a bit change. Here we use two sliding windows, W1 and W2. W1 being the cyclic prefix window and W2 being a subpart of the data transmitted. These sliding windows are slid over the data received so that we can find what is the difference, minimum difference between the sliding windows W1 and W2. The point of minimum difference is taken as the STO of the receiver. It can also be done by the correlation of the windows. The least the correlation is, the higher the STO is. It can also be done in the frequency domain because as said earlier, STO causes a phase distortion. So hence, the phase difference between adjacent subcarrier components can give us the estimate of how much STO is there in the receiver side. Now, moving on to the last topic of my investigation is the channel estimation techniques. Why do we need channel estimation at first? A channel is never ideal in a real-time system. So there are two types of estimators that I have used in for the channel estimation technique. The better the channel estimation is, it, the better the performance of an OFGM system can be. The two estimation techniques that I have tried in my project are least is least square and the minimum mean squared error channel estimator. As we can see in the graph on the left, that the linear square channel estimator performs worse than the MMSE channel estimator because the LS doesn't take into account a lot of complexities that are there in the actual channel. But it has an advantage over MMSE because it has less complex mathematical calculations than the MMSE. But when we see these two methods emerge with the DFT based technique or the discrete Fourier transform based technique of the estimation of channels combining with the LS and the MMSE, we see the DFT reduces the error that of estimation by a large amount and it performs much better because it takes care of the offsets that the LS and the MMSE channel estimators doesn't take into account. The graph on the the graph on the right shows the mean square of error performance when it's compared against the EB versus N naught in the DB scale. The red line that shows the LS is the LS estimator and that performs worse when it's compared for the MSE of the channel estimators. Whereas the LM MSE, that's the combination of the LS and the MMSE performs much better and is the best performer among the three. Now going for my simulations. This first simulation gives for the CFO estimation of the receiver offsets. Here in this simulation we see as I have described in my presentation this the pilot base that's the yellow line has the best performance compared to the cyclic prefix based technique in the time domain. 
Now, the moving on to the OSDM performance when it has the CFO in this shows that uh, for a 64 point FFT the channel has a lot of errors when the CFO is there. Now where we here we see the graph these are the the red line is the ideal channel B VR of an AWGN channel of an OFGM symbol and these are the other lines are the variation of the CFO and as we increase the CFO the VR performance goes drastically bad. Going for the STO estimation technique here this also has the same conditions that's a 64 point FFT and a 16 QAM. We have no, I have normalized the signal energy so that we get a proper signal to noise ratio. Here we can see that as the STO number increases, the actual point where it should be, it has a, a bit of deviation from what it should be the minimum point or and the this the blue line shows the theoretical calculation and the black line shows the actual main point that we get via the simulation. And the same has been done with an STO value of 2. And the graph on the right shows uh, with the CFO of being 0.5 and the graph on the left has no CFO taken into account. This is an STO estimation technique done by the channel impulse response. And it also shows the same properties as described earlier in the earlier figure. Going for my last simulation, that's the channel estimation method. This channel estimation method, I have done the same sequences of the FFT of 64 point, 16 QAM and a guard interval of 16 cyclic prefixes. As I have explained in my presentation, the same things are being shown in the simulated results. The LS being the worst performer compared to the MMSE, whereas when I improve it with the DFT based technique, I can see a huge amount of difference from this graph to this graph because the DFT takes into account the opposites of the LS that doesn't take into account. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you all for listening to me and that's it. Thank you.